privilege of uh, talking with Claude in his office uh, when I visited here to work with Emmanuel Gutierrez and Philippe Di Francesco on folding in the early days, origami, because it's a paper, which is actually relevant to uh, my talk today. So that's a nice kind of closed loop. Um, that, that when I talked to Claude was a very memorable experience, and he was always very engaged in working out things on the blackboard and so on. It was shortly after that that he died, but I had also the fortune of being back here for two kinds of sabbaticals, a short one and a very long one of this productive work, particularly with the manual duty. Um, so I hope uh, what I'm going to talk about today, this is very much a work in progress. It's a new kind of project. Um, I hope that it will be also of interest to to Claude Itzikson. It has a nice kind of mixture of hard and soft uh, statistical physics, hard condensed matter physics as its root with uh, soft uh, manifestations, soft fluctuations that are amplified by the hardness of the material that we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to be talking about the statistical mechanics of elastic membranes, which is very, very general and was highly developed in the 80s. I'll talk principally about pioneering paper of Dave Nelson and Luca Pipiti. But uh, here at Saclay, this was a very active area of interest. Alfonso Dadi, Paliti was also in the area, and Stan Leibler, various people pioneered you know, the development of this kind of um, physics, the physics of two dimensional elastic membrane. So I won't have random geometry, really. I have a lot more structure than random geometry, but that structure still allows a lot of flexibility. And it will lead to, it leads to one of the most beautiful two-dimensional field theories I have encountered in, in my career, anyway. Um, so, but in particular, we will apply the two-dimensional system mechanics of an elastic membrane to some more modern materials, and in particular, graphene. Graphene is a wonderful material because it's pure, it's very, very strong. You can take one square meter of graphene well, and make a hammock out of it and support a four kilogram cat, and the weight of the graphene is that of the one whisker of the cat. It's about a milligram. It has good electrical conductivity if you tweak it a little bit. It has extremely good heat conductivity. It's extremely pure, and it should not exist because it's a two-dimensional crystal. But it exists because of thermal fluctuations. It's exploring a constrained part of the random geometry of an elastic membrane. So soft effects ensure its, its stability, its very existence, and they also amplify the mechanical properties of the material. So this, recent, this project is a collaboration with uh, the experimental group of Paul McEwen at Cornell, one of the pioneers of work on graphene, uh, Itai Cohen at Cornell, and on the theory side, David Nelson and myself. And the outline of my talk is I want to review some of the field theory of elastic membranes. You might have heard of them referred to also as tethered membranes or polymerized membranes. They're, you can think of them as a 2D generalization of polymers that are cross-linked in both directions. I'll define what this system is. Review physics of the 80s of these systems. Talk about graphene as a membrane, but there are many, many other modern realizations and old realizations of 2D systems. But why hard systems? rather than soft systems where you might want to, we always thought we should look for the wonderful manifestations of thermal fluctuations of 2D membranes. I'll talk about some experiments of the McEwen group. This is a paper about to appear in Nature, doing graphene, measuring graphene fluctuations, and what we're proposing to do is to do graphene kirigami, slicing and dicing graphene to exploit the geometry to determine the mechanical properties using one 
materials, just breath in. That's this wonderful, pure material, but play with the geometry and the topology to produce many different macroscopic material on demand in principle. You tell me what mechanical properties you want, <coughs> and I'll tell you if we can understand the physics of the system, how you should achieve those. So that's the graphene curigami <coughs> and metamaterials. materials. I'll tell you about some simulations that we're doing in this area. So, old stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about a system with, a, with an energy, which has an elastic piece and a bend piece. And so this is two-dimensional elasticity of a sheet, but that sheet can deform in shape. So it has height fluctuations controlled by a bending energy. And here there are two elastic moduli, a shear modulus and a compression modulus. Shear modulus mu, compression modulus k. There are lots of nice examples. This is the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell, one of the classic examples. It's made of proteins, spectrum cytoskeleton. If you look at it closely, there's 70,000 triangular plaquettes. It sits on the inner side to scaffold the lipid membrane of red blood cells. So this is the elastic Hamiltonian. It's simply 2D elasticity. You can read about chapter 1, Landau, and Lifshitz. You, do, you deform the material, you define a strain tensor, UIJ. That's basically derivatives of phonon displacements. With a major wrinkle, there's a contribution due to fluctuations out of the plane. When you fluctuate out of the plane, you also stretch a 2D material. In fact, this strain tensor has three independent components, and you can never relax it by phonon deformations, which have only degree, dimension two, two independent components. You can never make this zero by having phonon relaxation of the system. Can't match the three degrees of freedom. So generically, you will always have stretching or strain contribution due to out-of-plane fluctuations. The bending energy is the classic Helfrich canon Hamiltonian, which is the mean curve, which is squared of the system. The Wormall function on mathematics. Notice that this is Laplacian of H all squared. So this is the famous biharmonic operator. You always counter in elasticity. So you can take this tensor <coughs> due to alpha train fluctuations. What Nelson and Pleti did, worked on in 1986, almost 30 years ago, published in 87. You can decompose that always into longitudinal and transverse pieces. Transverse pieces is written as this projection operator, PT. Decomposes like that. If you just treat the phone, drop any nonlinear contribution of phonons to the strain tensor, then it's quadratic in the phonons. So you can just integrate out the phonons and define an effective Hamiltonian or free energy for the system this way. That preserves the bending energy term, it has the same bending rigidity kappa here, but it yields a nonlinear stretching term for the reasons I described before. If you have a fluid membrane and fluctuate out of the plane, it can flow to adjust to the change in shape. But for an elastic membrane, any fluctuation out of the plane will cost you stretching. And that comes out technically as this nonlinear stretching <coughs> energy here, the projection operator acting on this tensor all squared. And the coefficient, when you do this Gaussian integrals, is the two-dimensional Young's modulus of the material. That will play a major role. The two-dimensional Young's modulus is very, it's, it's, it's an energy per unit area, but it's very large, even at microscopic scales, for graphene. So this term here is going to be very big for graphene because it is so strong. And so that will come back soon, so remember that. This is the actual form of the 2D Young's modulus. So you have bending energy plus nonlinear stretching. It's those nonlinearities that give rise to the wonderful field theory properties of this system. To see a little bit more clearly the geometry underlying this term, just know that the Laplacian acting on this operator is non-zero. And in fact, it's the determinant up to the sine of 
the second derivative of the height fluctuations, which is none other than the Gaussian curvature of the system. So this operator here can be rewritten, this one, can be rewritten <coughs> as Gaussian curvature coupled to Gaussian curvature through the Green's function of the biharmonic operator. So this is a long range interaction in 2D. So any bump in curvature here couples over long distances to any bump in curvature <coughs> here and helps to stabilize a two dimensional phase for an elastic membrane. If this were a ferromagnet, it would always be disordered. <coughs> the Lumen Wagner theorem. Thermal fluctuations at any temperature would destroy a magnetized phase. But it's not, you might like to think of the normals to the uh, discretized surface as spins, but they're not arbitrary spins. They're constrained to be in the normal bundle of the manifold. So what you have really is a Grassmannian signal model, a constrained signal model, and that constraint is essential that gives rise to this long range interaction. What are the implications? The implications are that the elastic moduli in the system, and we'll focus on the bending rigidity, are not constants. They are running parameters, just like the fine structure constant in quantum electrodynamics or in many field theories. They are normalized, they're scale dependent, and they'll turn out to be strongly scale dependent, and that's where the geometry enters. Any questions? So you can look at the Fourier transform of the height-height propagator in the system. From this term it should go as, so this goes as kappa 1 over kappa q to the fourth in momentum space. So you can define kappa through the height-height the, the propagator as 1 over kappa q to the fourth. So you can define the normalized bending rigidity this way through this two-point function. And you can calculate it perturbatively in y. Perturbation theory quickly breaks down, but let's see what we can do. So the normalized bending rigidity is a bare bending rigidity plus a fluctuation correction, I of Q. Look at the coefficient here, it's given by KBT, the temperature, times this Young's modulus Y divided by the bare bending rigidity. This integral here comes, has this form, and you can evaluate it by power counting. You can see you have two powers of momentum on top and four on the bottom. So it diverges at large distances. The momentum space diverges like one over Q squared. So that diverges like the length, the size of the system squared. Uh, so you need to self-consistently solve this equation to determine the running bending rigidity. So you can do that to get an, a rough idea of what's going on by replacing the bending rigidity in this equation by the renormalized bending rigidity at way back to q plus k. And then you'll see that this, this cannot be a constant. That will never solve this equation. Because you have one of a q squared divergence here and a constant here. It's not self-consistent. If instead you take this bending rigidity, so this KRQ has to have a form, basically KBTY over kappa renormalized times the one over Q squared divergence from power counting. So this means that kappa squared should go like one over Q squared, or kappa should go like one over Q. <coughs> yeah, that's kind of self-consistent solution with coefficient square root of KBT times Y. So this is what Nelson and Politi did. This is the phenomena of thermal stiffening of the bending rigidity due to fluctuations. What is happening if you take a stretchless kind of material? Paper is a good example. <coughs> Very hard to shear or compress, but it's quite easy to bend. So it bends all by itself. You can <coughs> corrugate it, of course. This is used all the time. You corrugate it like this, 
it's very, very stiff, extremely stiff this way when you try to bend the corrugation. It's floppy this way, very stiff this way. Thermal fluctuations are isotropic corrugations running through the system. So you take this and a snapshot of a thermal configuration, not random geometry, but still many configurations available. It's extremely stiff. This is, of course, a caricature of the field theory calculation. But this is what happens. <laughs> and paper is not a joke here. I'll show you that even though graphene, which is three angstroms thin, an atomic monolayer, is very different from paper, the thermal stiffening brings it back towards paper. So you can gain intuition from studying paper. So this effect is called order from disorder. The non-thermally fluctuating system would be unstable, but the thermally fluctuating system, the disordered system under thermal fluctuations, gets more ordered, gets stiffer, and it allows an extended membrane phase with long-range ferromagnetic light order in the normals. <coughs> This calculation can be improved in various ways. Actually, the shear modulus also runs. It softens at long wavelength. Another very interesting phenomenon. And you can refine this, but we don't particularly need that here. Just think of this. This is a, this is a rather strong running. Yes? Does that mean it gets floppier at low temperature? Yes, it gets floppier to, well, OK. Temperature dependence is a little bit subtle, but Yes, there's some temp yes, there is a temperature dependence, but the dominant one is really the size dependence. But yes, you really have to look at kappa divided by kBT though. It's a dimensional scale. But there is interesting temperature dependence. <coughs> that's not the one we will exploit. I'm going to talk about room temperature measurements, and that's where the current experiments are done also. But that's another degree of freedom one can exploit. Um, so how does it actually, how does this actually stabilize the system? So if you look at the long range fluctuations of the angle of a normal to say the vertical, theta squared, this is simply the derivative of the height field squared, so that has two powers of Q different from the propagator we considered before, so that behaves like the Fourier transform 1 over kappa are normalized times q squared. We have to put in a 1 over q here. So this now, without, with kappa as constant, this would logarithmically diverge and disorder the normals. But with a running kappa, any running, but it's a strong one, 1 over q, any running that makes kappa stronger at low q, large distances, will render this finite. So that's the order from disorder. And this was studied in detail by Aronovitz, Skolovich, and Rubensky, Rudelsau, and Ratsikovsky, 92, did a self consistent screening approximation, calculation of all this stuff, and verified this kind of behavior. You can look at the roughness of the system. It's an extended phase, but rough, just like this, a little microscopic roughness, and that's controlled by a roughness exponent, eta. So the renormalized bending rigidity goes like q to the minus an exponent eta. Eta is a bit less than 1. But we can just take the case eta equals 1 to gain intuition. The running of the shear modulus is controlled by an exponent a to u. The reward identities that relate a to u to eta and to the, the roughness exponent to eta. So you can determine everything once you have eta. As I said, eta is 1 in the nelson Politi calculation. The self-consistent screening approximation which looks at the running of shear modulus as well, gives eta about 0.8. A long time ago, we measured this in large scale Monte Carlo simulations, we get about 0.72, and so on. There are other interesting behaviors of this system. Um, when you have something crumpled up like this, at the infrared fixed point that controls this stabilized phase of membranes, if you now sort of, sort of like this, if you pull on it, it expands out in the transverse direction. 
<coughs> that's known as negative Poisson ratio of more exotic behavior. But here it's not controlled by changing the local geometry of the system. It's a purely entropic effect. It's the ironing out of entropic fluctuations as you pull on it that causes this effect. So it's more intrinsic. Field theory firmly generated negative Poisson ratio. And we push <coughs> that in simulations with the nice method in the paper of the Emmanuel in 97. Actual prediction of the, the Poisson ratio is a universal value of minus one third due to the behavior of the bulk modulus and the, and the shear modulus at infinite distance or zero momentum. So this is like anti-rubber. It's harder to compress than it is to shear by a factor of two. So let's get to graphene as atomic paper. Several things going on here. Uh, the Young's modulus of graphene is 20 <coughs> electron volts per angstrom squared. Remember, it's an energy per unit area. So we have to multiply by an area to get an energy. The bending rigidity of graphene at atomic scales is electron volts. What else it is? It's quantum mechanical bond. It's a beautiful triangular, trivalent graph. Um, with uh, carbon-carbon with bonds at the length scale of like 1.4 angstroms. So it has to be electron volt energy scales. Now, McEwen group's doing room temperature experiments. That's 1 40th of an electron volt. So your first thought is nothing is going to happen due to that bending is going to be enormously Boltzmann suppressed. It's 50 kBT. So you're dead. But that's not true. Because it's even harder for the thing to plastic, elastically deform. Because the Young's modulus is bigger even over the scale of a bond, one bond. So the only thing it can do is to change shape. And in fact, it does. It has ripples. It has thermally induced ripples. And that's also can be seen very geometrically. If you look at the ratio of the energy cost to, to elastically deform a piece of material of size L to, the, to bending it, that's given by the Popper one Kármán number, YL squared over kappa zero. And that is a very, just a purely geometrical object. It's given by the size of the system divided by its thickness squared. So graphene is the best you can do. Biggest Popper one Kármán number. It's atomically thin. So this Popper one Kármán number is of order for a 200 micron sheet of graphene that you can make. It's of order 10 to the 12. So it cannot elastically deform. It's, it wants to bend and change its shape. If you compare that to paper, it's about a factor of 10 to the 6 different. So naively, they look very different. <coughs> However, as I said, kappa stiffens under thermal fluctuations. So that's going to lower this effective Popper von Kármán number. It's geometrically dependent. It's size dependent. The other problem is that, go back to here, this correction here, let's look at what length scale is an order one correction to the bending utility. So let's set this equal to one. This gives you a length scale I call L thermal, which is kappa zero, the bare bending utility, divided by square root of y kBT. Y is very large for graphene. This is room temperature. This comes out as angstrom level length scale. That means thermal fluctuations over microscopic length scales are already doubling the bending rigidity and driving it non perturbative. So it's this hard effect in graphene that amplifies the normalization of the bending rigidity. Paul McEwen likes to call this Fopley graphene. I said Fopley graphene is self stiffening to bend. There are soft thermal fluctuations of a hard material. 
Graphene itself is described by two plus one dimensional quantum electrodynamics. So I hope uh, Claude at six and would have liked that nice mixture <coughs> of the field theory that describes the electronic behavior of the system with a field theory that describes its mechanical properties. <coughs> so the renormalized binary difference in terms of length scales is L divided by this L thermal scale to the power of the exponent eta controlling the running of the bending rigidity. So you put in a 10 microns for this length scale, L thermalized was, was angstrom scale, you get a very big effect. You get a a, a million fold increase in the bending rigidity for micron, 10 micron scale graphene. That is phenomenal effect. A million times stronger than you would have guessed based on quantum mechanics. And this is looked at experimentally. This is a paper about to appear in Nature. Here is sheet of graphene. Graphene is also almost transparent. It's so thin, doesn't absorb much light, absorbs about 2% of the light incident on it. Here's a micro manipulator that's going to push on this graphene sheet. You can push it, pull it back, it relaxes. See that? There's a blow up of that. I got these movies from Melina Bliss in the McEwen group, who did this for a PhD thesis. Just finish. Move along. Push it. It looks like about to push on it. It looks like you're pushing on paper. It's wrinkling up. But then it restores itself. This is a major strain of the system. And it comes back. Doesn't break. Very strong. You can do this over and over and over again. Here is, and here, I hope you can see graphene between gold pads. They make ribbons of various dimensions, and you can push on a micro manipulator on this pad here, and do all kinds of stuff. This is two ribbons, and this is four ribbons, and so on. You can play with the geometry. What, what is your scale graphene? The, the width of these is 10 microns. So this, so this is like 10 microns. <coughs> and then the, the length is uh, very... And then they change the depth of focus. So one of the first things they did is to measure the bending rigidity. You can do it two ways. You, you pin down one end here, so it's a diving board. And you can put weight on the end and just measure it from there. It's Kx, gives you the spring constant, is mg. Uh, or you can turn it on its side and look at thermal fluctuations of this graphene ribbon. This is what you would expect if you didn't know about thermal stiffening. Get a result down here. This is, this is uh, the, the length of the ribbon and uh, the width is, like, as I said, like 10 microns. Instead, let's look ar around here, you know, between 1 and 10 microns, the measurements, this is 10 to the minus 7, this is 10 to the minus 1. Six orders of magnitude different between the measurements and the bare bending rigidity predictions. And here are theoretical slopes due to the field theory calculation that they just mentioned. They're roughly consistent. There are other sources of ripples, of course, but I won't go into that right now. Here's a blow off of that. The spring constant, you can, from the spring constants, geometrically related to the effect of bending rigidity, it's just the width divided by the length here. So you can back out the effect of bending rigidity and then see that that's much bigger, millionfold bigger than the naive predictions. And this blue shows gravitational measurements, black shows thermal fluctuation measurements. They're roughly consistent. So what is the idea of uh, this collaborative project we have? It's to slice and dice pure graphene to produce metamaterials with distinct elastic 
what do I the mechanical responses. So we start with this. You can imagine doing origami on the system, but graphene is too strong to fold it. But you can cut it with lithography. You can put holes in it. You can put slits, holes, change the topology, and that's going to affect its thermal fluctuation response. So we'd like to understand that so that we can make understand bulk materials made from graphene and what properties they will have. Uh, with uh, Andre Cosmill, David Nelson, and a uh, former postdoc, Ruskus Kometnik, we've been checking these ideas with uh, some multi with uh, molecular dynamics simulations. We pin down one edge to simulate the gold pad of the system, and then we play with the length and the width of the system. You can look at um, long ribbons, and of course the cutoff for the bending rigidity is going to be the shortest length scale in the system. So in this case, a ribbon, the running of the bending rigidity will be cut off, as this one here, will be cut off by the width of the system. So it goes a bare bending rigidity times the width, <coughs> dimensionalized width, dimi you know, dimensionless width, width divided by L thermal to this power eta. If it's a sh short ribbon, what we call a flat, so that the width is larger than the length, then the length will cut off the running of the bending rigidity. Here's what thermal fluctuations of these ribbons look like. You can see they're significant, pinned here fluctuating up and down here. This is width 10, length 100. Bottom is same width, double the length. You can extract the renormalized bending rigidity from a persistent length if you think of this ribbon basically as, um, as a, a polymer. And so it has, of course, it can bend like this. That's its lowest degree of freedom. It can also bend this way, which is hard, and it can twist. So you have to take into account all of those. But the dominant one is bending along its length. So from the tangent-tangent correlation function, the polymer physicist, Hanyakov and Rippin, taught us how to measure from the persistent length of that correlation function, the effective bending rigidity as a ribbon. So here, from here, we can, it's given by the width divided by KBT times the bending rigidity. So we can extract the normalized bending rigidity from measuring this persistent length. And you can see this is the width in units of L thermal. So when the width is less than L thermal, bending rigidity is constant. And when width, even as it's comparable to L thermal, <coughs> the bending rigidity starts to rise. And here we've only reached a factor of 10 times the thermal bending rigidity, so only one decade of thermal siphoning. So we haven't quite reached the asymptotic regime, but you can see the effect is setting quite dramatically. From here we can extract an experiment eta. You can also measure the width average root mean square height fluctuations of the system. That should scale like the distance x along the river <coughs> divided by the persistent length cubed. And here's a whole bunch of simulations, many, many, many of them, that fit, <coughs> relax onto this scaling prediction beautifully. So that seems to fit. Now, playing with the topology. Here's one thing you can do. So the first geometrical thing to play with is the aspect ratio, width divided by length. That's good a lot of control. But now you can slice and dice it. So this is some simulations of Emily Russell and Russell's commitment. Here's a reference ribbon fluctuating. Here's a ribbon with a short slit. Can you see the slit there? So now each lip of the, of the slit is fluctuating, not independently, but freely. Here's a longer slit. And here's a slit that goes all the way to the end. So it's almost like two independent ribbons with half the width. Now what happens here? We look at the root mean square height fluctuations. They go down with longer slits. That's weird. 
you think that it would get wilder if you start slicing it. But when you start slicing it, you have a long a piece of slit ribbon, half the width. So the bare nudity is, hasn't grown as much due to thermal stiffening. So, um, so that means it fluctuates more there along the slits, and that effectively shrinks the length of the system. And I said that the root mean square height fluctuations grow as x cubed. But the system, when it's fluctuating wildly, has to, to preserve the area, basically has to shrink. Normal fluctuations will shrink it. That makes it effectively shorter. But that makes the macroscopic height fluctuations less because it's not as long. So that's a possible explanation for this effect. So you can currently strengthen it to height fluctuations by slicing it. Very counterintuitive. Now, what we'd be really like to do, and this is what the experimentalists have been doing, is to do fancier changes in the topology to build, to really do kirigami on these graphene sheets to make structures that naturally lift into the third dimension, like this pyramid here, this spiral structure here, this kind of structure here. This was first designed in paper by the Luna Blitz and then done in graphene. So you do large scale kirigami on the system, cut a lot of holes in it make it flexible to deformations intrinsically, uh, flexible to shape change. And the wonderful thing is that the electronic conductivity really doesn't care. The electrons flow over the carbon and the pi bonds that are above and below the graphene sheet. So they don't see these holes. But the mechanical properties will see them. That's what we would like. We'd like to be able to compute the running of the bending rigidity of this kind of surface. This is a nightmare, <laughs> but interesting. Here is, you can't really see it, but here's thermal uh, electronic conductivity. There are two curves here. <laughs> one of them, the orange one, has a 240% strained piece of graphene, and underneath is the unstrained system. Conductivity is indistinguishable. So the idea is now, what is the renormalized bending rigidity of this kind of structure? So let me conclude, I hope, from oh, Claude cool, maybe saying the same thing he was saying to, uh, uh, to Zubair, <laughs> but I uh, hope not. Um, the conclusions are that this is this is a remarkable interplay of hard and soft matter in graphene statistical mechanics. It's a wonderful realization of a 2D elastic membrane. We sought <coughs> this kind of behavior in soft systems for a long time, but this is better. Now the material properties are strongly geometry dependent. We can exploit geometry and topology to determine behavior of the macroscopic materials. Uh, and you can start from a single wonderful material and many of its cousins like molybdenum disulfide, uh, <coughs> many others, to design distinct metamaterials with a variety of mechanical properties with one source, which is just this cool allotropic carbon. Thanks. Topological boundary limits in the graphing, the sort of stuff that Lubensky does. Um, I don't <coughs> think so, but you certainly do if you take bilayers. Bilayers give you a lot of interesting structure. 
Um, I don't think graphene alone has it, but I might be. Uh, I mean, do you want do you want them as for topological insulators or for mechanical values? It's mechanical. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. As a live <coughs> for like, Vincenzo Vitelli, Jason Paulus, and Brian Chen have been working on that. That's possible. So what do you do? do I don't know. I haven't. I don't know how. I mean, they they studied one-dimensional linkage systems mostly. So um, those are basically sine wood like solitons and one D linkages. Those occur uh, for bilayer um, graphene because of the you have the increment, you have one ladder sitting on top of the other, and uh, you get that kind of behaviour. Solitons. I don't know if there are two D solitons in this purely hexagonal lattice of graphene or I don't think so. It's harder to D to combine to get these edge ones. But maybe it's it's good. So do these holes um, affect the strain significantly? I mean my cat has he Need to go on a diet if I put it on one of these sheets. So that's what we'd like to answer. We don't really know. Um, putting a lot of holes in it should knock, certainly knock down the bare bending rigidity and might enable you to access. So the elastic membrane may also have a high temperature crumpled phase. It's never been seen in any physical realization of these membranes because they're self avoiding and because they stiffen due to bending rigidity, but by knocking holes in the system that may weaken the bare bending rigidity sufficiently to access a crumpled phase. So that's definitely weaker. Yeah. There'll also be sources of plasticity, holes, you know, like dislocations in the system. Those naively weaken it, but you saw the effect of slits there. They seem to strengthen it. Uh, and that's true even in material science, dislocations can be can block plastic flow as well. But it's a tricky problem. So I don't 